thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we're doing a series of these events uh, last week and this week and uh, a little bit next week. So we're enjoying uh, getting feedback. The meeting's entire purpose is to hear from you, so there won't be too much talking. I did want to share with you that the strategic planning process is fully underway. There's a strategic advisory group that's about 25 members made up of representations from various different groups, including students, faculty, business, community, parents. Uh, yeah, that would be the five times five, 25, 25 or six. Uh, th that group's met twice. They uh, will meet a couple more times. They uh, get the feedback on interesting information, outside of the speakers, that sort of thing. Uh, they uh, inform us a little bit, and then we're trying to make these groups extend that uh, focus, extend that capability, get input from community members. Uh, we're also meeting with senior leadership on a regular basis, trying to work through the current status of the district, the key processes, things that go on, so that we have a good, well-rounded understanding of what, what is. Uh, uh, Jim and I will to work with all these groups and work through the process of creating a strategic planning document. Our document is a little different in that it won't be a checklist of things to do. It'll actually be, we'll actually be developing some key processes to allow for ongoing continuous improvement and innovation. We will be identifying a series of opportunities for improvement, which will then be incorporated into an ongoing process that will begin after the planning gets done. Uh, we'll also be working with the district over the next six to eight months to make sure that those, those processes of deployment and uh, ongoing opportunities for improvement are managed well. If it sounds a little vague, it probably is because we don't want to be here telling you about something. We want to hear from you. So we're going to have two parts. Jim's going to do a little segment. By the way, Jim, Jim Lay. Uh, he's a person that helped us really do great work in the school district. I was superintendent. Uh, we were very successful in, in putting in some high quality systems and also high quality student performance. He uh, works in the public and the private sector for, uh, he's a, an organizational tourist, as he refers to. Uh, works, uh, is Baldridge examiner, uh, works on strategic planning. And also, actually, it has first-hand experience. He left a board that he was on to take over a troubled uh, retirement community as CEO and, and actually put all this theory and practice in real terms and did a fantastic job. So I'm thrilled that he's working with me. Uh, I'm Bob Summers, 40-some uh, years in education, uh, classroom teacher, a uh, whole series of other occupations including uh, superintendent, uh, secretary of education for a couple different state governors and odds and ends, but most importantly, uh, really committed to student success and engagement of high quality school districts like Springboro. So, uh, Jim will get done with his section. I've got a little couple of documents to share with you to get your input on, and we look forward to your conversation. Jim? All right. I'm really glad tonight because we just uh, before you at the earlier session we put a four person through a seven observers two facilitators one attendee and that experience she, did it though. she, she, did it. she, she held up I'll tell you I, you know I thought it was everything not to make it an interrogation but there was no one to play off of so <laughs> You know, what, that is that is really a big ingredient. So uh, I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, I just I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves to uh, just a simple profile, so to speak, that helps me help us as we go forward. It's a very simple question. I want to know who you are, what your relationship to the district is, and what led you to come. So, who wants to start? Go ahead, Heather, thank you. I'm Heather Bauer. I'm involved in the district through the local PTO. Okay. I'm a pre-K administrator and third grader and assistant reader. Okay. That's great. Right. Right. And 
what led you to come? I was nosy. That's <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'd rather hear firsthand. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when it involves your kids, why not? Uh, my name is Sandra, and I'm great. I have two children in the district. Okay. Uh, mostly for volunteering at the PTO. Um, I came today because we are working really hard to make this our home, make this retirement, and okay. education has always been very important for okay. us. Um, I just, in order for me to understand how, it's easy to criticize whatever you don't like about a district, but I feel that if you go and you educate yourself about the processes and how things go, then it gives you a better understanding. So that's where I'm at. Okay. I'm in a place I want to really understand. How long has your husband served? He just had his okay, let's see. Is he approaching he the twenty year two, threshold? Is that what I'm hearing? Three years left and he got four before that, as I said, for service. So he had about twenty two years. Okay. Left. Okay. That's great. I'm uh, I understand my daughter is uh, married to an infant uh, individual in the army who is they are moving next week from Augusta, Georgia to Paso Robles, California. Oh, wow. And so we get to go down and help them with the transition <laughs> next week. So I'm learning the military life through many, many channels. I have two in the military. My son is uh, just uh, found out he's going to be promoted to major in the Marines. So and he's also moving. He told me north in, in Iraq, where they to be with the Kurds, who everybody I guess in, everybody in the Middle East hates them. And I said, well, that's just the place I want you. To <laughs> so. I'll go here. Uh, my name is Wendy Surikoff. I have two sons and the high school. Okay. And um, I heard something about the strategic planning process, but I just wanted to, to find out more about it. Good. Good. Glad you're here. Last but not least. Yeah. My name is Brad Frost. I have uh, two girls in the district, and uh, uh, we've been here um, eight or nine, ten years now. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it led me to come here from my kids understand what's going on, but also from a business aspect, I mean, <clears throat> I get involved, you know, at my place of employment was strategic planning, but also the impact of seeing the young kids now and trying to work with them at a workplace. And so- It seems to be very euphemistic, we might explore that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I know that I'm not that old, but sometimes I feel like I'm old when you start to try to deal with the kids, so it, it, it's a different, I guess, different understanding now of what, what they learn, how they learn, and how to interact with them, so it's... And what's the business here? I work now, actually, at a construction and steel fabricating business, okay. but just um, the interaction of how people communicate, it seems to be much different now, okay. and so it's... Okay. Interesting. Okay. Well, I have one other question I want to get to before we get into the rest of the conversation. I want you at some point in the conversation to make sure that you answer this one. What is it that you feel compelled to tell us? As we're looking to gather the information and what's necessary to help really form, uh, welcome, uh, to form uh, a plan that is relevant, impactful, and meets the aspirations that families and a community uh, have for what the schools do. I want to make sure that we, we don't have anybody leave here tonight without having given us that compelling input you think we need to hear to help us with that. And I'm going to put you right on the spot and just ask you to introduce yourself real quickly in the context of your relationship with the district. Uh, I, uh, my name's Deborah Harris. Okay. Um, I was a little torn between the parent and community one. Probably by the time anything gets done on the strategic plan, I'll just be a community member. My son's a junior here now. Okay. Um, okay. I have a daughter that graduated last year. That's great. And you have a wealth of experience <laughs> to share for us as we learn what can, we can build on and what we need to change. Okay. So that's perfect. That's what will be very helpful. Looking forward to hearing all of your perspectives. And I'm going to start with the, the concept of what we'll do. We're going to go through what in strategic planning. It's a tradition that everybody's probably seen at some point in time if they've ever been connected with an organization in a leadership role. It's called a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T. It's not a disciplinary strategy, it is a strategic <laughs> planning process. 
Strengths and weaknesses are the internal aspect of the district. Observations we can make about the district. Opportunities and threats are external in nature. What are the things that are coming that we need to be connecting with, taking advantage of, uh, really leveraging? And what are those threats out there that can be really challenging to us and hold us back? We're going to start in the internal, focusing on spring growth through the context of the S and the W, the strengths and weaknesses. We'll make a, a clear progression then into looking externally. But I want to start with a reflection, really, on the district through, the, through those two ideas. And let's start with the strengths. What is the Springboro School District good at in any of your minds? What are we good at here? As you look at your experience with the schools, your whether it be lengthy, whether it be short, whether it be as a stakeholder, a parent, what are you thinking? What are the strengths as you see them in this district? I feel like we've known to turn out pretty high quality educated students, I mean, whether it's standardized testing or, or other, or high, you know, enrollment rate in colleges. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, we're doing something with that. Okay. Okay. Oh. Open the people themselves are the strength. I mean, I think of a district that the teachers are paid less than in neighborhood districts, and we have wonderful teachers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have people with lots of experience. And then you also have a community about that characterization of teachers as wonderful. What does that look like? It looks like um, teams that are very experienced, okay. people who have been teaching, because you know you can't really replace experience at the end of the day, that helps. So people mm -hmm. who have been teaching for a long period of time who can mentor the new ones coming in okay. and help them. It looks like people who don't care just about the test grade, but care about the child as a whole. Okay. Uh, the people who have little kids at home, but they're still making at six thirty in the evening to tell me that you know my child with autism made eye contact today and it was a great day for him. Um, compassionate, willing to to really look at the whole child. Okay. Okay, great, great. Others. What makes you when you, somebody talks to you about your kids being in Springboro, what are the things you tell them about? somebody about that is the strength of this district when they say I'm looking to move to Springboro um, what's this, what are the schools like what is it what are, what are the strengths of the schools what would you tell them I think we've done pretty well with technology I, mean, I know we've had the whole Google classroom and I've spoken with people in other states or other areas that haven't been as on the forefront of that okay. now I think there's a delicate balance between that and the amount of education comment within there you said what, what that we're pushing on the kids what's the well I, in our house we're pretty cautious about the amount of technology we use okay. Um, okay. And, and I think it can be it's very impactful and, and kids can utilize it in some amazing ways but I worry that when it comes to solving problems um, later on in life that it seems like I experience that people have less ability to take initiative to solve the problem. Like if it's not in front of them, you know, if they can't just figure it out, then it, it, yeah, I feel like it slows that down. It's the creativity that comes from, I don't know, when I was a kid, you're outside playing in the woods and building stuff, and you're just putting different things together, but and trying to solve problems. But now it's, if you're not being rewarded, you know, whether it's a phone, it's, you know, there's a lot of engineering that goes behind all that that I've, you know, done a lot of reading.
just the movies and the film strips, right? Yeah. <laughs> I lived in the film strip era, I understand yeah, that. <laughs> How about the other two of you? Anything from a strength perspective you want to share with us? Um, I think the um, financial plan for the district has gotten significantly better. Um, so I think, I, you know, I guess it uh, all remains to be seen. I understand there'll be a new money ask coming in the not so distant future and um, to be able to get, I guess, kind of like to the last renewal and uh, increase got us out of the ditch. So now we're back on level ground and now it's time to accelerate from there. So um, I'll be interested you know, to see how all that goes as it leads to things like increased technology or technology that includes more creativity and problem solving and things like that that we might be able to capitalize on. With. As an outsider, that's the tourism part that Bob was talking about. Tell me, take me back 10, 12 years perspective wise. What's the, to reach today, where did we come from from your perspective? What was the challenge? So if it was 12 years, I think my daughter was in kindergarten at Jonathan Wright, um, but not Jonathan Wright. Is that what it's called? Like yeah. The one that is now grass? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jonathan Wright. Um, so that's obviously different. You know, com the, the two elementary schools are different since then. Um, who's in those elementary schools has changed a few times. Um, well, how that, they're set uh, up. From the financial things. perspective, what, you know, you talked about the very vivid image of getting out of the ditch back onto the right. road is what right. I'm hearing. Yeah, I think um, class size to me is a big deal. I think mm -hmm. our class size is too big still. Um, and uh, so I consider that being in the ditch when you have um, extremely large class sizes. And, um, you know, okay. sure. at the same time as you have, you know, enter your own opinion here on what the uh, teacher contract looks like and what teachers are being paid and those kinds of things. So, okay. from my understanding of that, is mm -hmm maybe being paid less and having a classroom with up to 30 children in it is kind of a bad mix, okay. when you say right state. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so I think trying to repair some of those things, um, so that hopefully is okay. on, on its way to improving. Yeah, that, that's helpful because, you know, the, the past is important in the minds of a community. You mm -hmm. know, their, that their perspective is helpful. But what about the weakness side? What do you see, you know, uh, because that kind of bridges us into the weakness conversation. What do you see as the weaknesses of what's going on within the, the district itself? What are the challenges or the weaknesses or opportunities? What don't we do so well is another way to look at this. And we are really interested in these. Okay. Are you sure? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey, I, you know, um, it's the easiest way to go is down the path to, with, with blinders on. You right. know, let's open those blinders up. Well, it's a compilation of things that may not be huge right now, but five years up the road may be okay. a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Talking about class sizes, um, class sizes have gotten every year, there are more kids in the classroom. Starting from you know first grade to kindergarten, you have a lot of kids in here with very different abilities. Mm -hmm. um, then you get into you know the third grade when they separate gifted and non gifted, and, and again this can be opinion based, which is difficult for you guys. But everything is so s separated, like everything is so that there's such a distinct line by abilities, how the children are grouped, that we almost miss on those opportunities for those who lack social skills to benefit from those who are maybe a little bit more street smart and vice versa. Okay. Okay. Um, Money-wise, I mean, teachers don't get paid what they get paid when they were in districts. So we run into that fear of what's the environment in the buildings like? Um, it, it's, you know, do we lose these teachers with 20 years of experience when we can only afford to hire people fresh out of college? What will that look like eventually? Okay. Um, Definitely, for me personally, communication is still something that, though it's being worked on, it still lacks quite a bit. Right. Um, Explore that for me a little. I know, I, you know. I'm going to say, we live in the world of social media. Okay. We live in a place that has grown immensely in the past 20 years. 
behaviors, but can still have that small town mentality, which has, which is my appeal to it. You okay. know, like I love okay. that, but at the same time, we tend to ignore things like if, if something happens, whether you try to keep it quiet or not, canceled, I know. Um, well, pa parents are a network, right? Yes. Yeah. And, um, a lot of people in the community, you know, they, the teachers live in the community or their parents are volunteer in the buildings or um, there's just a, it, it's a difficult thing to navigate. Um, there has to be a balance that we're, we're still as a district trying to figure out and it hasn't quite been reached yet. Okay. Um, that you use math is that more across the board is that a particular area of that's focus that's one area that i've noticed that okay. the changes i don't the other one is thoughts about weakness in the district? I have a, a couple of bullet points to go back and add on strengths. Okay. It took me a minute. Sure. It, it, it's all fair. That's all CCP fair. It, this is huge. yours meeting, not yeah. mine. CCP is huge. That's a huge strength. Okay. And um, okay. so my daughter is hopefully then now going to finish her undergraduate degree in five semesters um, at OU after having done CCP for basically two years. So um, that's huge. It, was great. It was, it was great preparation for her for college classes now on her campuses. So that was definitely great. Love that. Um, and I know that's helped with overcrowding that I think we would have more of here as we get more kids in the district and new neighborhoods being built even as we speak. Um, and then clubs at the school, athletics too, yes, um, but clubs and the um, the ability for students to start clubs if there isn't a club that's you know in their um, wheelhouse or their interest or whatever so my daughter was able to start a uh, classic literature club um, well, that she that. actually got people to come to I <laughs> that with what she loved to read right? <laughs> uh, this, like, they did all kinds of different things and um, and uh, she tried to get her brother to come and he was like yeah, nope. <laughs> that's not, 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 my, that. not my thing they played across <laughs> yeah, we played across at the classic literature club we'll but um, so, so that was, I think, really cool for her to be uh -huh. able to do, and I think sure. like there's a car club now, and so things like that, to be able to you know, exercise some of those creative outlets and areas of interest okay. and explore those further. I think it's great that, that the district accommodates that, the high school accommodates okay. that. Um, weakness time? Pardon me? Weakness time? Okay. Um, I am concerned about there not being enough attention given to, it kind of ties in with what we're talking about too with gifted, um, the mental well-being of the students. Okay. 
um, it's you know it's I, we definitely I de definitely want to be challenging students and um, you know I have at, at, from very various different experiences obviously across my kids have always gone to Springboro so they've only been here um, in first grade my son was given third grade level books to read and that was great for him he was given harder spelling words those kind of, it was perfect in second grade he was given second grade material and he was getting in trouble all the time and all of that stuff and um, and I, this teacher actually said to me let him have an easy time while he can it's okay just don't worry about challenging him now or whatever I'm like yeah you're a teacher um, so having like those different experiences just one year to the next and then it got better and then it got great and all was well um, but then in high school the the my, my daughter is built like the, these are the kids that I'm concerned about she, she is the perfectionist the her goal is not an A her goal is a 100 or 110 if there's that opportunity and that's a standard she applies herself not me I always feel like I have to tell people it's not me I swear um, A's and B's best you can whatever it is I'm good with but um, and there were a lot of students like that and her grade the whole cluster of them you could pretty much go down the top 10 in the class and find the kids that were staying up literally all night studying um, I have a sister I understand yes that. right I learned I learned by that example we learned both directions yes. from examples don't yeah. we? <laughs> it was it was really scary actually because um, obviously not sleeping it has a really detrimental effect on your mental well-being mm -hmm. and then having that perfectionist attitude and everything else towards that and um, a lot there was um, in one of her AP classes a lot of what was kind of busy work kind of stuff that just took hours to do it was like writing answers to questions like I did in high school you know at the end of the chapter kind of thing um, that it just it was crazy and she did take a difficult schedule for sure um, but it was I think the students that have that kind of mindset and there are a lot of them I don't think that there was really much realization and understanding to the kind of workload that was being put on kids that choose the AP classes that choose CCB that choose honors you know they choose it and they're not going to not choose it that's the thing that's the problem um, so how can the district better support those students and um, challenge them and in different ways I think that um, kind of in contrast uh, to what she was saying about uh, her kids seeing the same thing in, um, in the different, same, different grade level classes, um, it always seems like honors or AP has been like more, like shut more into this time frame rather than broader or deeper or more conversation or a, like a, a, just a deeper understanding generally of the subject matter rather than just more, just like shove more. And um, so I think there's some opportunities for that. Okay. Um, do, you, do you see that, I mean, you obviously talked about your daughter, and this is coming from within, mm -hmm. and this is who she is, and you're looking yes. for, I'll call it a regulating factor right. to help with that. Conversely, do you also see this coming from other sources that are pulling kids who may not have that strategy into that same kind of, uh, how should I say, uh, vortex? Sure. I mean, I think that, um, you know, a lot of the, the pressure and like from, from wherever it comes, you know, whether it's from the district or the students or the parents or whatever, you can, there's all kinds of places that you can look to those influences. And a big one is college admissions. So, um, you know, in talking with an admissions person at UK at an event, um, he was like the most ridiculous person ever. And I was like, I would never let my daughter go to UK just because of what you said. Um, he was like, I want you taking every AP class there is and every this and like, you know, load it up and blah, whatever. And I was like, really? Is that, that makes you good people if that's what you're doing? I mean, she certainly could and basically did do that, but that shouldn't be the strategy. And from what I understand, Ivy League schools are changing how they judge those kinds of things. And it's more about the whole person and a well-rounded person and not so much about the hardest classes you could possibly take and all of them and perfect scores in them and those kinds of things. So relaxing that requirement and understanding that there is value in students that aren't getting 
4.5s or whatever, um, and, and that, you know, I always like to talk about Carl Linder in Cincinnati, who had eighth grade education. He did okay, you know. Um, so it's not all about that. And I think that as colleges start to change their strategies, that'll start to relax some of that so that um, we can go about it the right way instead of the shove it all in there way. So leaping across the threshold for a moment into those external forces, you're just describing what is a changing element in college admission and college expectation that really bears monitoring and or influencing mm -hmm. to the degree possible. Fair way to say it? Yes, definitely. Okay. And, and making sure that that's understood because that's the other thing. So then we have my son coming along who has taken basically the exact same course load that my daughter did. Mm -hmm. And I was worried about that because my kid, my son is much more like me. My daughter came home from homecoming to study. My son went to a bonfire, right? Yeah, right. She only went to homecoming once. <laughs> um, so, um, so I was worried because he didn't have that same kind of dedication. So now I can see very clearly there's a lot about her personality, but she had 10 other friends that were doing just the same thing um, that caused it. So, and of course, I'm out. She's not gonna listen to me, I'm her mom, you know? like. That's, that's not helpful. Um, so, you know, trying to help her understand what the, the right and healthy and best way to manage through those things. Sure. She had a great learning opportunity that started at three o'clock in the morning one night when she realized she missed an, uh, in an online CCP class, missed an exam entirely, was supposed to have taken it by midnight and found that she was supposed to take it at two in the morning and the professor couldn't have cared less that she was a junior in high school, gave her a zero and gave her no opportunity to do anything about it. And she ended up with a 99 in the class. So it's like, had the, the opportunity to see that the world doesn't fall apart and it's okay, bad things can happen, you can recover, you know, but some of those kinds of, like having that understanding, certainly helping her now, you know, in, sure. in school, but you know, just trying to, but her sophomore year was a very scary year. Okay, um, other weaknesses that you see, other things that, you know, this isn't the speak now or forever hold your peace moment, but at the same time, uh, it might be one of those things where I want to move on to the external side. Sorry, I have one more. Good, that's why I asked. That's why I asked. And just because she brought that up too, and, and, and it triggered a lot of conversations, that, that's kind of what I referred to of the, they're so separated that those kids would benefit from learning from the ones that are not so high achievers socially wise. It goes back to that. It's, so there's a there's a collaborative as well as an individual track that has to be managed in the process. And yeah. uh, the way that these kids are separated into the different uh, ability groups, in my opinion, is also a little bit flawed. You have kids who don't test well. Um, there are other ways, portfolios, teacher recommendations that like we're very narrow minded in that. Like when you even even if the child needs to be a little bit more challenged and you still remain close to the classroom. Um, it's difficult to get them out of those boxes. It's it's very difficult to, when they're into one of those tracks, it, and it happens early on, it's very difficult to help them switch across. Um, and mental health, we really need to start paying attention to that, even at the elementary school levels. Um, it's it's there is a lot out there that I didn't see until eighth grade that my daughter was witnessing by third grade. The social intelligence of these children. When you say there's a lot of that, what is that? Um, some of these girls have the social intelligence of a 16 year old in the third grade. Okay. The bullying is very complex. They know their ways around the system. They know how to beat the system. They, there are people who have been teaching 20 years witnessing things recently that are kind of boggled, like I, I can't believe how blind I was to the situation kind of comment. Um, there is elementary school, they go to lunch. They have a certain amount of time to wait, what is it, 20, 30 minutes? And it's very much quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. They have to sit with their classmates and it's the whole time it's quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. And, and it's kind of stressful. You get to sixth grade and I have a kid who is very young with a grade level and she doesn't always click socially because she's very immature compared to other classmates. 
she wants to bring a book into lunch because she doesn't enjoy the socialization aspect of it and she's not allowed because lunch should be to socialize. But she's been told for five years, quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. Now you're in sixth grade and it's like, okay, no, no books. You guys may, you know, learn how to make friends and let's learn how to do this. And it's like, for an 11 year old, that's tough. So you had like a moment in high school, we were just talking about this in the fifth grade meeting where kids who don't want to be in the cafeteria, sometimes they have a room that they can go to and read and eat their food there. I, I don't really know the basics of how it works. Like something as simple as that in a sixth grade building, seven, eighth grade building, and paying more attention to mental health in elementary. Um, homework can be very big sometimes. I have a child who does, he gets home at 3.30, he starts therapy, he has autism, starts therapy at 3.45, ends therapy at 7 p.m. Monday through Thursday, and we just got Fridays recently. It used to be Monday through Friday. He excels in school. He never gets more than five to 10 minutes in schoolwork, but sometimes he has that additional page that will you know, make him have a meltdown because he's exhausted. Like, just looking at those individual cases is a little okay. bit different. Sure, okay, all right, thank you, thank you. How about if we look outside this is kind of a bridge to the world when you talk about the the social maturity and things of that nature what are the forces out there that you see as you know these are emerging opportunities for the district that we need to be paying attention to we'll get to the threats you've given us a real good indicator of one of those but what are those emerging elements things that either we need to grab or that are opportunities that we need to integrate what do you think about when i when i give you that description what's important to you from the outside world and how it should impact the schools and the experience of your students well I think the outside world when you sit here in Springboro you you kind of lose perspective is that that small town mentality? yeah I mean we all like the small town right I mean uh -huh. that's part of why we live here we, in Ohio and Dayton I mean it's you have all the greatest things in small town but <clears throat> with that be, being lost in your own world I think and for these kids that get stuck in, and I, I hear this a lot where the kids get so focused on school and they get it and it's not always like you're saying it's not the parents kind of putting that pressure but I think if so and it's hard right we all have a responsibility to this but <clears throat> getting perspective of what others are dealing with you know whether it's just our surrounding communities and whether it's the the tougher life that they're living, you know, whether you go to downtown Dayton or go to the other places. And if you have, if we have the means to have kids travel someplace else to see, but it might bring a little more perspective to the homework load or being so focused on 100 when you see the others that have so less than you have. And it's the things that are day to day survival of shelter and food give these kids some more perspective on life and, and that it gives them a more real life balance. So I don't know if that's the opportunity of, of having programs or things coming in or up our students going out, but it's, I know that's difficult. Yeah, so it's that um, being in your community but also in the world. Mm -hmm. okay. I hope that the, he's working with the ROTC program at Wright State so he can interview for Air Force scholarships quite often. And one thing that he always comes home with a lot of frustration is his kids come for the interview. And I mean, they're obviously amazing kids with great opportunities with zero social skills. And that's a, a, a virtual world that they grew up in. They, they, they forgot how to make eye contact, how to shake a hand, or they come and they, they give you all these academic accomplishments which they are so proud of that they should be, but then when you ask them about them as a person, they're clueless. Their entire world revolves around that 4.5 GPA or the, you know, and he talks about this over and over and over how when they go into the real world, that's not really, nobody's, it's gonna be a big Nobody has really asked him in a long time what his GPA was. Exactly, <laughs> so that's something that. Yeah. I think I agree with that. I think that that is huge the opportunity to do um, some more um, I guess kind of career exploration 
for students here to, to take a look at? So I, I think now it's just only the second year of having a career fair or a career day um, at the high school, which I think is a really cool thing, mm -hmm. albeit, um, to, to be able to let students try to visualize what they might do when they grow up, what what avenue they might take. My sister in law just told me this story anecdotally. She does um, the costuming and stuff like that for the town hall theater. And her the students that were in the, the show asked her what she does for her job. She was like, Oh, that be this, like this is my job. And they're like, That's a job? That seems too fun to be a job, you know, things like that to be able to understand, like, yes, that can be a job if you're interested in fashion or if you're interested in whatever, that can be a job. And um, I think uh, helping students understand those kinds of things. So we did um, an event last summer that we brought a couple of um, Springboro students to that allowed them to explore some um, opportunities in the consumer packaged goods industry and, and be able to kind of have a little bit more hands-on experience and more opportunity to understand what's possible in the real world. And I think doing some of those um, sort of soft skills, like actually having, I don't know if it would be classes or what around teaching those kinds of things, those are the kinds of things that can make a difference between whether you get the job or not with tons of candidates that you have. If it's like everyone's the same, but this guy looked me in the eye and shook my hand and was very pleasant to talk to, so he's the guy. If it's, it can just be something that small that can make the difference. Okay. All right. um, Brett, what do you see, uh, you know, in the sense the threat is being outside of the environment where you can see the world. It's also a desired environment in which we can raise our kids the way we want. Uh, what do you see as factors that are coming? I'll take one, I'll, I'll put one out there. This community, uh, you drive around, you can't help with everything I've learned about it, you can't help but see growth in this community. And at the same time, what I hear in these meetings are, you know, that to happen. I mean, you know, we've got our we've got our formula. What are some other examples of things like out there that you see that we need to be preparing for and dealing with? It's a huge concern. It's a huge concern because as all of these, we have no more buildings, we have no more rooms, and all these you know, they're building houses, building houses, building houses. Like, you know, we're not going to have enough space to do Okay, and the, so in a static sense, the growth is a yeah. it's a challenge. So the you know the threat of that out there says, what are we going to do about it? Rather than you know, what's the likely thing that we're going to do? Be able to stop all development? No. No. So the likely thing is we better be ready to deal with it. What are other threats that you see? Money. Okay. Money. Like we don't we don't develop a lot of businesses in Springboro. Uh, a lot of the businesses that are in Springboro, the money goes to other adjacent so the, the money goes to other school districts. Okay. Um, past new levies here, we don't have a history of being super open about levies. Um, and the amount of growth and the amount of spending is going to require one. I think that's going to be one of the biggest battles. So, is gonna face so the threat, area. I just want to make sure I explore this with you to get the right thoughts. The threat is in one aspect, tax base, it's all residential. Yes. The other is do we even have enough money if we're static? Just in the mentality against levies, whether it's What do you think the source of it is? You know, to, I'm an outsider. Help me with help me get a grasp from the grassroots perspective. See, so this is how you get in trouble. As an outsider, because I want to think you're six years, okay. I would say it's the small town, the small town mentality. It's the, well, if you could do this 10 years ago with this much money, why can you still do it? Like, okay. Why are you not more fiscally responsible? I see posts on Facebook all the time when, when they're talking about how a teacher can go somewhere else and make $10,000 more. And the comments are, well, if they really love their job, they will do it for the $10,000 less. In one thing, I, I, don't, I can't relate to that. I can't understand it, but it's definitely a big part of the community. Okay. Okay. I saw a smile over here. It's well, it's comical to me because those same people, probably aren't the people that will say, Go ahead, you can bypass me with a raise. Like, right. man, they're, they're placing employment. They're not saying you can just go ahead and skip over me. 
from my right hand, or give it to somebody else. So I find it funny that, you know, our community being one of the highest household incomes in, in the Dayton area doesn't want to pay it a little bit more. Because the reality is, is I mean, I'm as cheap as they come. I'm an accountant, I'm cheap, thrifty, <laughs> whatever you want to say. I can squeeze it all out of everything. But you seem to be three-dimensional. But, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I have no problem paying a little bit more for something that you're going to get value out of. Uh -huh. You know, I see value in, 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 in paying a little more in taxes. And just, you know. So it's the, it's the definition of the distinction between cost and value. That's yeah, very I, mean, I think we need to expose people, and when they make comments like that, or get some understanding, say, well, what do you really mean? Or what, what's your point of trying to achieve that? Because it's easy to say, I don't want to vote for something because it's a little more a lot of dollars, but what value are you going to, is going to correlate back to the, the, the school system? Go into housing markets, like the value when the schools go south because of lack of money, but you still can't seem to get through. So, yes. I moved here a little over 10 years ago from Washington, D.C. area, okay. and um, these the, the same types of problems have been existed in Springboro ever since I moved here. And it's interesting because where I moved from was Northern Virginia, um, one of the wealthiest counties in the country, one of the uh, still remains one of the fastest growing counties in the country, right. and still remains one of the top school districts. They don't have these types of problems there. Um, this concept of a levy doesn't exist there, and so that's not an issue. Um, and in Loudoun County, where we came from, uh, what, what happens is if they get to a certain number of, of kids in a school, I think it's either 1,500 or 2,000, they build a new high school. So now where we move from in Loudoun County, they're up to three or four high schools right now. So these problems really don't exist. Um, and so it's interesting to me that we've been talking about these same problems for over 10 years. They still exist. And so so there's an element of, of system reform that is out there that we see we need, but we have to live within the system until it reforms. And so how do we deal with that? So that's that's valuable. Other threats you see? I think just generally funding, the way funding works okay. in the state of Ohio okay. for, um, for where money comes from and how much of it comes and the um, dilution of those funds to public schools by um, charter schools, ethically failing charter schools, and, and that, that kind of thing is um, definitely a threat, depending on you know where that goes moving forward. I would say, for me, I don't know, this is critical thinking. And I think we need to make sure, and I don't know how it is at the high school level, but I do a lot of reading on this technology thing, and, and I California, where all this Silicon Valley stuff started with the technology, they are, and those public school systems out there were, which were the first to adopt, I think, um, some of the, the technology, but these are the people, you know, engineering it, but now they've actually either passed or reverted back to not allowing to have computers or reducing, dramatically reducing the experience of a student um, in technology within the school system. And I don't know how it is that everyone else is placed in employment or whatever, but what I want from any job I've ever had is I want someone to be able to think. And and I don't, it's, you know, it's like you're at home with your kids, take out the garbage, empty the dish, you know, like it's fine if you just point and, you know, but as an employer, you don't want to do that. I, I mean, it's terrible to have to manage people like that, right? I mean, it, it takes forever, but if we get our kids to think, you know, and I don't know if we take away the busy work, and this is very high level because I know it's hard for teachers and everybody else to actually make a curriculum out of this, but getting our students away from this homework base, because I was terrible at it, you know, this production of stuff to a way where we're to producing. And I know that has to happen at home, but somehow we got to reinforce it with the things that they're learning. I am going to step out of the way because if there was ever an introduction to bring Dr. Summers forward, these last comments were it. Anything that has to be said, have you said what you needed us to hear? Because I don't want you to walk out of here and say, I should have said. One more little thing. Sure. Um, that would probably come in the opportunity category okay. is um, understanding the um, ideal school schedule for 
the different ages of kids. Okay. So that popular topic being later start times for yeah. high schoolers now and then cascading then earlier times for the younger kids that are you know, right, waking their kids, their parents up, um, those kinds of things and understanding what the right way to manage that is. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Saunders. Yeah, I would say that was about as close to a same way as I, I've heard in all the groups. <laughs> What I'm going to do is actually introduce you to a couple of documents that are uh, uh, not even draft, they're, they're kind of a starting point, and we want to get your reactions. Uh, the first one, I'm actually going to reverse this because of the conversation. Uh, let me see if I've got enough. I think I've got enough here. Um, what I want to begin with is the notion that we are thinking about what's it mean to be a graduate of Springboro City Schools and what would that graduate look like and the, the term we're using is a future ready graduate. So you see why the segue works, right? Uh, you're describing what you want to see in the workplace. Um, some of you have been describing it in different ways. You've been describing it as you want to more well-rounded child, you're worried about, you know, 100s being the only thing that counts, that sort of thing. So, what we had two choices to go, we chose one of them. One would be to spend 45 minutes to an hour to let you write down what do you think the skill sets are that are would prepare your, your children to be successful in life. The other one is to take some multi-million dollar research that has gelled this at least into a, a single page and say what do you think of these ideas and then we'll do three things where ultimately I'm going to describe them to you but we ultimately want you to circle the letters of the ones that you think should be there cross off the ones that you don't think should be there because because they had a million dollars of research doesn't mean they know what Springboro needs and also, if it isn't there and you think it should be, just use the back of the paper and actually write uh, some things down. Let me describe what you're looking at so it doesn't look overwhelming. Uh, quadrant one is content knowledge, is basically what most of the conversation tonight has been about. It's mostly around academics, English, math, science, social studies, the arts, languages. They have two items that may not appear naturally is one is career related technical skills you've talked a lot about the notion of actually how about our students actually being involved in doing things not just studying about them or just not reading about them or just not looking at a computer screen so career tech has a beautiful opportunity to do that work it's not career development hang on to that in a minute and we'll talk about that the other is global knowledge Quadrant two is habits of success. It's the mindset, the way of thinking. When I when I think you you said you want employees that think, it isn't. They're not. They may be technically competent, but they don't know what to do with their technical competence. They don't know what to do with their academic prowess. So work ethic, self direction, perseverance, grit, tenacity, self control, flexibility, positive mindset, learning strategies social skills and responsibilities, service to others, things that the literature and a lot of research has shown that people that are highly successful tend to have these things. They have the ability to work through complications and failure. They have the ability to stay at the work effort for a long time. They, they are able to be flexible and adaptable and, and drive self-control. Item three, uh, a lot of people would refer to these as 21st century skills. These are the big picture, so I need to know math, science, and English, but what do I do in the way of critical thinking and problem solving? How do I think about solutions in life? How do I find ways to put my knowledge to work in a way that's going to benefit me, benefit my company, benefit my community, benefit my family? Creativity and entrepreneurship. Uh, creativity. Can I uh, just take directions, or can I create directions on my own? Uh, communications and collaboration, information, media, technology. 
E is an interesting one, practical life skills, the ability to understand and manage personal finance, health, independence. And then the last one, I want to describe the last square as being a series of knowledge, skills, and attitudes that you would have to answer the following four questions. What are you passionate about? This is for the student to answer. What are you passionate about? What are you good at? What does the world need? And what will the world pay for? So there's a lot of people that don't get paid. They really love it, but uh, they still live in the basement, right? You know, relying on somebody to take care of them. So it's a four point question. Surveying the college career and life landscape is all about, okay, so what do I love? What am I good at? Then how will the world pay for it? Does the world need it? And then how do I get myself from where I am to where I need to be? This is not a skill set that's just for when you leave high school. It's a skill set that is, is a lot of people think everybody needs over their lifetime. How many of you have had to change jobs a few times? Uh, you know, change careers maybe even uh, sometimes. So that's what item four is, is that whole idea of helping people figure out what they want to do, not to tell them what they're going to do, but help them understand how to get there. So first of all, comments. What do you think of the four? What do you see? What do you like, dislike? Four is great. I literally just had a question or a conversation on Friday with a 28 year old that lived at home in a basement. <laughs> the exact thing which you described. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to be at this job? If you don't, what are you going to do when you leave here? And it, it, what you want to do, if it makes you happy, what is it going to pay you? Yeah. And basically, and, and it, I don't know if she ever had that conversation, but I, I mean, I was going to say if you don't want to be here, that's fine, but I want you to know what it's going to look like if you go someplace else. So I hope that, I mean, I'd like our students to have that conversation in high school or pre-college so they can, or as they're going into college, so they understand. Because there's a difference between being happy and getting a paycheck you don't like, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a delicate balance. The, the sweet spot is when you can answer yes to all of those with the same, same kind of thing. And that's where people that don't, they don't go to work, they go to have a life and they actually get paid to do it. So that's the kind of place that we hope to get everybody to. But yeah, interesting. Uh, we often refer to those kids as Nikes, no income kids with an education. <laughs> yeah. so, other thoughts, comments? I think um, the you know conversation about mental health and mental well-being helps feed this a lot too because you know maybe the 28 year old lives in the basement. I know someone that's not quite in that circumstance, but close enough, um, <laughs> that um, I think he just doesn't think that he can do better. I, don't, I think he just doesn't have the personal confidence and, um, you know, like the, the wherewithal to understand that he's capable of more. And um, so that's probably something that, you know, was fa failed him earlier in life, you know, in high school, college, and um, in those areas where, where that could have been maybe a stronger message. and. And not just the message, but then, like you said, the opportunity to actually do something and see, like, oh, I can, I can do this, and I can do this better than people around me. This is an area that I excel in. And a lot of the work in schools um, will talk about the importance of kids wanting to be in school. It has a lot to do with putting your knowledge, your newfound knowledge, to work, to do right. something, to be engaged in some productive activity. So, I, I, I grew up on a family farm so every day from the age of seven I worked and every day I went to work I didn't know I was going to work I just thought that was part of life so you know that those make huge differences and so how do we make those possibilities in in school is, is an interesting yeah it really captures some of the addition of content knowledge but a lot to do with that item three two and three you're not going to have a class on perseverance. What you got to do is design experiences so that students fail and pick themselves up and, and, and succeed more than just have the right answer. But there's a problem if our kids don't ever fail and they're not going to work. Like you weren't to work at, at seven, right? Yeah. But the problem is, is now we've, and this is for good, you know, whatever, 
water right. We're so protective of our kids, which is okay, we're a loving family, that's great. But they're not out running around like they used to. They're not experiencing, they're not experiencing yeah. failure and not learning. And so, I mean, it didn't take much for me not to get 100 on a test, but I mean, I, I think it, should be, it shouldn't be possible to get 100 all the way through school, in my right. opinion, right? <laughs> Now, so, me, you so, take a half a test with your daughter, but I mean, it's just. <laughs> so, think of, of lots of the things that we really learned from. By, by the way, I, I grew up on a farm that also my uncle was the head of the physics department at Capital University, so I learned all the physics I needed, but it wasn't in a book and it wasn't on paper. It right. was. So, that planter, how do those seed, those rockets, what do they do to change the speed? How many seeds are going to drop? And I thought I was going to die from all the calculations <laughs> that we had to do. I just wanted to do the work. But, but you get the idea. It's trying to develop those situations. So, so, that's kind of what we have here. If you would take just a few minutes and circle the ones that you want. If you don't want to do it right now, I can easily give you a card. You can uh, do it at home. and. Uh, and uh, email it to me, take a picture. Dan is the pen man. Back the pen here. Man. You need a pen? No, I was going to say that just so as something else is not just major, but realistic expectations. Yes. Because right now, we live in the age of passion. Every eight year old knows what they're passionate about if they're skipping school to go to a tournament because they're going to be able to go to or they're going to Process. In fact, that's a pretty good segue. So the question is, um, this next paper is our attempt to uh, help the board define what is the what is its aspirations for the district. So I'm going to let you have a few minutes to circle those, and then we'll pass this paper out. Okay. Sure. Thank, thank you for that, Holly. Uh, and that's a good point. Not all students are going to need all those things. What, what they're talking about is that to be a well-rounded, highly successful person, regardless of what the future is, you need, you need an increasing level of all of those things if you circle them all. That doesn't mean that the family doesn't cover part of it or the community doesn't cover part of it. The school may not cover all of it, but we want to document and make sure that we do our best to. To, uh, put the student across the finish line as a graduate with these skills in place. Uh, usually when we talk about the whole child it's less about it's less about perfection and it's more about how far have I taken are there some areas that I want to excel in more than others uh, what what fits with my life but the attempt would be that we would actually consciously educate young people in all those areas In my, to use my personal experience that I just talked about, work ethic was not something the school had to worry about. Because from the age of seven, I learned that organically. Yeah. Yeah. So, to give you a sense, it, 
it isn't like we're we're not going to have classes and all those things. What we have to do is design systems and bring them out there. And there are schools that can do that very effectively. I'll make an observation about the failure issue. How many of your kids play video games that fail all the time mm -hmm. and persevere? So think about that's actually something they're indebted if they understand their quest to succeed is what drives them back from failure. So there's something there to be harnessed. Yes. And I, you know, the answer to that, it's easy to say. The how-to is a different story, but think about that. Your kids are actually experiencing failure in something they love. Yes, I, I noticed that it's a redeeming quality. It's one of the relatively redeeming qualities of, you know, Fortnite and everything else that they're doing now, but, um, and I watch my son's reaction when he loses, when he's close to winning, and you know, just. And what does he do? He jumps right back. He does, and he's disappointed, mm -hmm. but he doesn't like freak out and start throwing things or anything. So I'm like, okay, this is good. This is great. Like, like you said, because I think that has become probably unreasonably important to them. Like, you know, the video games and that kind of things in, in their grand scheme. So if it feels important to them and they fail at it consistently, but still come back, like you said. I think that maybe is, there's maybe some good life lesson in there. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. How Sure. Does global knowledge differ from other studies? Um, I, I would gather from the, the literature that I've reviewed, global knowledge, social studies tends to be an awful lot about uh, government societies and that sort of thing. Global awareness and knowledge, I think, is more about current events and, and how the world functions. Probably, uh, you know, if you think about it, the, uh, the origins and the current status of great religions, the economic powers of the world, the military powers, and also the ability, you know, how do I, how do I start a company and take advantage of by global sales, slightly different than the social studies. Yeah, I, I was thinking if you're, this assumes that we're going to do this for all students, not several groups. Well, it's like I'm looking at communication and collaboration. Yeah. And that's like so many different types of early world problems. Yeah. And that's where the sixth grader is in the very high school in that group. My is at the other end. I'm sure she functions really well collaborating with the group with similar skills and abilities. But in the real world, they're all going to be together. They're going to break each other's head off. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. But I feel like these are, you know, trying to practically circling everything, but I feel like there are degrees of importance. Like, I think they're all important, but you need more of this and maybe not as much of this and that kind of thing. Yeah, and we have said, you know, if you have some key ones you want to highlight, that's good. What, what I found interesting, we talked at the last session, um, I, I do this, I do some of this work with uh, chambers and business groups. And if you have a business group that you don't start with this list, but you start from scratch, you have HR, CEOs, that sort of thing, um, almost 100% of their responses will be in categories two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. The yeah. only thing that they, they on occasion will report in one is reading. Right. All the rest of it is, and, and yeah. it's, it's because most of that is kind of common knowledge that the academic requirements for most occupations are dwarfed compared to communications, collaboration, problem solving, work right. ethic, showing up on time, working with people. What was it that, that was it in this group? Somebody said, uh, Carl Lindner graduated from yeah, eighth grade. Eighth grade, yeah. He didn't do too bad. <laughs> he did okay. Never made it through what second quarter freshman year in college.
dollars. What I'd like to do is shift gears and we'll do one last thing with you. Um, the sheet of paper that you have in front of you says uh, Springboro City School Board's aspiration statements. The key is draft for discussion only. In fact, uh, what the board's actually said so far is in this section two. So this is the actual material that they developed at the board meeting. And they had a series of votes that kind of highlighted some key things. I've put to pen to paper to write five of uh, these uh, yeah, aspiration statements based on what they said. So I don't want you to attribute those to the board. I, I'm What I'm doing is trying to get feedback on those five, what you like, what you dislike, what makes sense to you. And then the board will make some final decisions on whether these are the right aspiration statements or, or something different. They're all based on conversations and the, the feedback from the board. So the five, aspirations are Springboro City Schools will be successful when our graduates experience the success they desire in life. So obviously a long-term strategy, one that looks out to the future. You won't be able to directly measure life success for 10, 15 years with the idea that we would actually pay attention to somebody's future success rather than just graduating as a significant decision on the part of the board. Um, we'll, we'll have metrics that measure each one of these that are much closer to the school, but uh, that, that kind of that aspiration. Number two, our programs develop the whole student is defined by what it means to be future ready. So the sheet that you just circled are some important decisions, whether we do all of them or part of them or, or some subset or a different group. But it's, we're going to try to do the whole student, not just academics, not just athletics, but a more complete picture. Number three, our exceptional educational experiences make school a desirable place to be for students. Simply put, if given a choice, the kids would still show up. Now we do have teenagers. <laughs> I, we, we now have a grandchild that's a teenager. Talk about painful, you know. All the other ones have grown up. But, you get the idea on number three. Number four is the very best faculty and staff are attracted and retained. And I know you folks have talked about the low pay and some of the challenges that, that uh, have, have been identified tonight. And then the fifth one, I, I think you've spoken directly to this one, is community investment in our schools fully supports our desired student success. So in other words, finding the value to have an exchange value. The board, I think, speaks, it speaks to employees are well resourced, students given back facilities and resources needed to succeed. So this whole idea that, that we have to have a, a trusting relationship with the community that will bring this value for this price, that price would be fair. So uh, what do you think? The five, do they kind of make sense? Be excited about a school district that accomplished those. Very good. Any thoughts? Were you at the board meeting when they actually did some of the work? Hopefully, I captured it correct. I think they're large enough where you're not. <coughs> metrics will bring a little more precision to them, but our goal is to try not to be just about a state test. So you, you talked about the state testing. We're, we're trying to, we're at least thinking about uh, Springboro has done extremely well on state minimum requirement. So it, it is well positioned because it's a good school district. It's got lots of advantages. It is positioned well to start to venture out into something beyond the minimum state standards of state testing and that sort of thing. And so that's, I, I think the board is trying to capture that. 
And that's all we have tonight. We really appreciate you coming out. Hopefully you found it valuable. And if you need a card, I'm happy to uh, uh, pass on the card. So if you have thoughts later, we'll be happy to share those. Uh, if we can get those papers from you that did the circling, we'd love to have that input so that we can add it to the other rooms. And if you want a copy of the paper, I'm happy to give you